going to get started. And um, we'll let folks come in as they come in. Thank you all for coming out. Um, it's been pretty miserable outside today, so I very much appreciate that you're here. My name is Cassandra Hemingway. I am the Outreach Manager at the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District and the Compost Educator. Um, in the back, the person who signed you in is Dan Joyce. He is working with us. He's, from, he's a CCV student, and he's been doing amazing things helping us out. Um, and we have Orca Media here as well. Um, and also our Orca person is a Solid Waste District School Program Coordinator. So we're all, and then in the back here we have a former district person too, a former treasurer, board member, compost truck driver, and a bunch of other things. So, um, so we're gonna get started talking about compost. And before I get too deep into it, let me just go to my first slide. Um, I wanna ask how many people here already compost or have already compost? Tid, one, two, three, well, four. We have a compost thing, but it doesn't work very well. Perfect, <laughs> five, six, yeah, and I compost. And there's a, f a few people who have never composted? Great, I love it when there's a mix. Um, and just, now I wanna start by asking why, for those who do compost, why do you compost? Or why are you thinking about getting started? And you can just call out your answers. It's bad for the landfill to have it full of food scraps yeah. that generates methane. Yep, the comp food scraps in the landfill generate methane. Peter, and then... Um, Just uh, save space in the garbage bag. Yeah, I do have to so do less stuff in your trash. Soil amendment. Uh, yeah. At least in the flower yep. beds, yeah. the vegetable garden. Yep, and over here. Soil yeah, <laughs> I know. That's why I always composted was for my garden. And then also before Act 148, I just was like, I'm not paying to throw away my food scraps. I can, I'm not putting them in my trash because I can make compost out of them and save the money on the trash. Any other reasons why people are here? The wildlife like your compost? I'm so glad you brought that up. We, ha we are gonna talk about animals and how to keep them away. Have you had bears in your compost? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh. They over and they have a seat. Okay, can, you, can we hold that thought? Because I definitely want to talk about bears and other animals. And if you're lucky, you get, I mean, have a very casual compost system. You get free food. Casual compost. Well, I like I, that. We have, we have a container, and we also just have a pile. Yeah. We've never used. Oh. Well, we're going to have to fix that. Use it. Um, I, I also get the free tomatoes. I put it in, I don't get my, most of us composting in our backyard won't get it hot enough to kill weed seeds. So if you've ever put a tomato or a, squash in your compost, it's gonna come up like grass in your garden when you spread it out, which can be kind of cool. So uh, some other reasons uh, that I put up here, they might not necessarily be yours, about a fifth of all the materials that go to the landfill is food scraps. And um, as I didn't get your name, Fran pointed out first thing, um, that turns into methane in the landfill. And I, we do know that the one operating landfill in Vermont up in Coventry is actually capturing methane for energy, but they cannot capture all of it and they will not. And they actually, it's off gassing and they're, uh, you know, like flaming, flaring it. So it's, and methane, you'll see in this slide in a second, it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, also, if you put your food scraps in the trash, your trash is gonna stink. If you put it in your compost, your, if your compost is stinking, you're not composting right and I'm gonna teach you how to have your compost not stink. But basically, stink trash, not stink compost. That's a good reason right there. Um, garden, and we talked about other folks' reasons. I'm going to move on a little bit quickly because usually I take an hour and a half with this whole thing. We're going to do it in an hour. I just wanted to point out methane is 30 times more potent as a heat trapping gas than carbon dioxide. And that's like, I've actually seen the numbers. That's a, that came from Science Daily, but the EPA, I think, says 24%. I've seen it. The, the numbers change depending on who's calculating it, but it's um, basically a lot more powerful than carbon dioxide. Um, so it's a really good reason not to generate it if we can help it. I'm gonna take a minute to talk about the Vermont Universal Recycling Law um, because that's the law that bans food scraps from the landfill by next July. Um, so I'm not gonna go deep into the history and I'm only gonna focus on food scraps for this. But just as a quick background, it also bans recyclables from the landfill, and that's already been in place. And every business that generates food scraps is already 
getting their food scraps out of the trash, either by f working with farmers or having commercial compost facilities or haulers working with them, or donating food. Since the law went into place, food donations to the food bank tripled. So we're keeping all that stuff out of the landfill and it's actually being used as a resource instead of trash and turning into methane. Um, so some people call it the compost law. It is not a compost law. The law is you can't put it in the trash. Um, composting is the most viable option for most of us, but you can um, bring it to a drop-off site that, such as a transfer station. Um, most of the transfer stations, actually all of them in the state, now take food scraps. They will charge a fee because it costs them money to, to haul it, but um, that's an option if you don't have a backyard system that you want to use or that if you don't have the space. Obviously, backyard composting is a great way to deal with your food scraps. Some, sometimes working out a neighborhood sharing system is a great option. That's not really infrastructure, but I have neighbors who bring their food scraps to my compost, and I know there's a couple sort of informal setups like that. Um, community composting is something that's being developed around the state right now. That is a system whereby if you're involved in, say, a community garden or sometimes even like an apartment site, um, or at North Branch Nature Center, we have one set up. If you're a member of the Nature Center, you can drop your food scraps off. They're composted on site, but all you have to do is drop off your food scraps, and if you want to help and be part of the team doing that, you can. Um, and then the last thing I want to say about the law is that meat and bones are exempted from the food scrap ban. So with the idea being nobody is expecting you to try to compost your meat and bones in your backyard. That is something we discourage. It can attract animals. It's definitely possible, but you have to be a very serious composter and really know what you're doing and be v managing your pile regularly in order for that to work. So, curbside haulers, are they going to oh. be collecting? Or did you skip those? For, I skipped over curbside haulers. Thank you. Are they going to be collecting? Well, that is something they, the, the haulers have been asking for exemptions from the law ever since they were supposed to get started. So currently, they've pushed it back to 2020. It's up to the legislature. We have a legislator right behind you in the room. Um, <laughs> not to call you out or anything, but um, I'm not sure how it's going to sugar off. I think it's likely the, the law for the, the law actually requires haulers to offer a curbside hauling, but a lot of them are resisting because it means retooling. Casella, I think they're doing it in Chittenden County. Um, so their argument is that it's very expensive in the rural areas, and it is. Um, it may come down to, in, uh, you know, where concentrated populations may have it, but the rural areas may not. Um, right now, we do have a curbside hauler in, in the Montpelier area. Her name is Megan. Um, she has a company called Earth Girl. If you haven't heard of her, Google it. Um, she will pick up from your home. Earth Girl Composting. Yeah, she's a small one-woman show, but she hauls food scraps from people's homes, um, just like the way you get your trash or recycling hauled. Yes? Uh, Casella is picking up across the street, across the tracks here at the apartment building, down the street apartment, for food scraps. You, you know, sure you're not thinking of Grow Compost? Because I'm pretty sure Grow Compost picked up that. Something is picking it up. Yeah, we have a, there are commercial food scrap haulers, um, and the only one operating in, in this area right now is Grow Compost, and they have a truck that looks a lot like the Casella okay. truck, so it could be, it's, it looks like a big garbage truck, but it only yeah. takes food scraps. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, and they're doing all the grocery stores, and they do the co-op and um, restaurants and all of that. Where you are, my, my having chickens be another option for getting rid of your food scraps. Definitely. Chickens are a great option. If you have animals that will eat your food scraps, that's even better. Then you turn your food scraps into eggs and meat. I don't think people do that, though. They don't eat them? I don't know. They don't really like a lot of things I put out there. Really? Yeah. you got to change yeah. what you eat to yeah. what your chickens yeah. like. They don't like, like, lettuce gives them crazy stomach problems. Like, really? You can't feed them, like, all these salad greens, like, the things you think you feed chickens. Maybe, like, when I had chickens, they would, I would give them the food scraps, and there was always some left over. Like, they would eat, they wouldn't eat the watermelon rind. So then that I would break up and compost that. So it might be it's not a it's not a it's not a full fix, yeah. but a partial fix. Um, so we're going to take go. Uh, this is important because everything we're about to talk about is going to drive the reason why you're going to compost the, the what the techniques for composting that keep out smells and animals. 
But real quick, I just want to ask, what do you think of when you think of compost? Call it out. Well, eggshells. Eggshells? Animals Coffee getting grass. into my stuff. Animals getting into your stuff? Well, yeah. Oh, and so I told another person who has animal issues, we are going to talk about animals. So uh, what else did I hear? Over, did you say something? Yeah, coffee grounds. Coffee grounds. Yeah. I'm so glad you guys said that, because what I want to point out, this is maybe me being a little bit semantic. Compost is not food scraps. It is the mixture that was made out of food scraps. So it is this. Um, it is the decayed organic matter used for fertilizing, conditioning land. Let's not forget it's a value added product. Anybody who walked in the front door walked by rows and rows of bags of compost available for sale, most of which was made with food scraps from the local schools and restaurants. Um, and it's a, there's a dictionary definition there. Converts residue material into an easy to handle hummus like product. So um, as an example, this is from one of my coworkers compost bins. You can smell it, touch it, feel it. It doesn't smell like coffee grounds, eggshells, or stinky stuff. Um, you will see some whole eggshells in there, but that won't hurt your garden when you put it in. So this is really important, this part. This is, uh, the, never forget that compost is not sterile. It's alive. It's, there are billions or trillions of microorganisms in your compost pile, and if you don't have them, you won't have compost. You'll just have an anaerobic mush. Um, they are living beings. They require the same kinds of things that all living beings require. Um, so just like if you think of your microorganisms as your pets or as you know, like a set, your, farm, your farm animals, they need food, air, and water, just like other living beings. So the food would be what? food scraps or also um, like the carbon based materials you would add like leaves or wood shavings. Um, air is when you turn in your compost pile and every now and then in Vermont, not as frequently in other places, you may need to actually water your compost pile if it gets too dry. So just keep in, that's, we're going to come back to that over and over again. Um, this is, I'm going to skip over this slide. We're going to talk about this stuff. Oh, I really wanted to talk about it. <laughs> um, I'm going to, we're going to talk about it. Part of the other piece of composting is particle size. I mean, if you really want to get picky, you can chop your food scraps down to smaller pieces. Um, greens and browns is really important. We're going to talk more about typically you would add three times as many browns as greens. So a brown is a carbon-based material. I don't know if this can be passed around. This is examples of browns. Any of these things you can mix in with your compost. My favorite is wood shavings, not wood chips, wood shavings, which you can, if you don't know somebody who's a carpenter or a builder, you can actually buy a bale of them at Guy's for $5. Um, but you can use anything that any, uh, not anything, but anything that you see in that, um, demo there. Sorry, that's a little cramped for passing that around. So if um, you don't add the brown, you're not really getting compost, nope. you're just getting... Nope. You're going to get mush. You need the brown. And that, for some of you, you've just learned everything you need to know and you can leave now. I mean, you basically need three times as many browns as greens. And greens are your food scraps or like if you just mowed your lawn and you add all your green lawn clippings, you need three times as many browns. So I don't recommend putting in a huge pile of green lawn clippings necessarily. Um, lots, of leaves. lots of leaves or wood shavings, or you can use shredded paper or any of that stuff. Um, can I ask a quick question? So you don't consider grass brown? It is if you like let it dry. Okay. Once it's dry, it's a brown. Same with oh, leaves. Brown, oh yeah, I meant browns is basically another way of saying carbons. Um, it's it's a little bit you know greens and browns is just a simplified way of talking about like nitrogen rich and carbon rich materials. What about If it's been composted, it's already compost. You can just use it in your garden. Um, yeah, because that's like a pretty good mixture of greens and browns already because horses are, usually horse bedding has, is very dry often, so that would be already mixed. Yeah, and chicken, like if you get into manures, it's really like, depends on, like chickens are usually very wet. I would almost like compost that separately and then mix it later. Um, so, and this is, uh, I'm just because as, a, as adult learners, we often need to be hammered over the head before we remember things. So I'm going to hammer the three to one thing throughout. 
um, just if you don't remember anything else today, remember three parts browns to one parts greens. So the leaves need to be shredded? That's up to you. I mean, they'll break down faster if they're shredded, but it depends on if you have something that you can shred it with. Yes? So, uh, I just cut them into strips. Basically, I, I'm trying to figure out how to deal with my chickens and waste. And so, I can't figure out what that ratio is. Like, what? Yeah. So for chicken waste is like a different animal almost. Yeah. I would, it, uh, when I raise chickens, uh -huh. I would throw their manure into a pile. Uh -huh. You could even do an open pile for chicken yeah, manure because you're not adding food scraps and just give it like, you know, a couple months, turn it. And then, you know, after about six months, it should be ready to use in your garden. I, you don't, if you're putting uh, bedding in there and you have bedding and chicken manure, and just leave it. Just yeah. Yeah, it's going to be wet. It's going to be really nitrogenous, but it's going to need to sit and compost before you use it on your garden. Okay. Yeah. Like that in itself, like I don't have to stick food scraps and no. make up stuff to go it's, in with No, you don't. Not for, not for chicken bedding, but you do need to compost it. Okay. If it's very, very wet, you might want to add some browns, but the part of the reasons why we emphasize so many browns com with greens is because that is going to um, reduce smells in your compost and reducing smells is going to reduce animals. So for chicken manure, you don't really have the concern about animals the way someone composting food scraps does. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit different. Okay. But you're fine if you just put it in a pile somewhere in your property and let it be, flip it in a couple months and then come back and grab it. Um, so we did talk about this already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But so browns are wood shavings, leaves, straw, shredded paper. Just one note about shredded paper. You can put shredded paper in your compost, but don't only use shredded paper as a brown. You need other things. It just doesn't have enough body. You're going to also need wood shavings or straw or something. And the ink on shredded paper isn't a problem putting it It isn't. No. I, um, years ago, that changed. They're almost all soy-based inks now. Um, and the nitrogens are anything that's still green. So your food scraps, they're, they're wet. Um, often, if you're weeding your garden, weeds are fine, but I recommend leaving out your weeds that have gone to seed because those, are, those seeds are not going to die. Most of us are not hot composting, so you'll just end up spreading weeds around. Um, in case you didn't get the point, three to one. <laughs> So this is just a visual of the point. If you have one bucket of food scraps, you dump it in your bin, you should have some kind of like a covered bin next to your compost bin. I use a trash barrel, a Rubbermaid trash barrel. And if I have one bucket of food scraps, I just kind of scrape in and visually get, I actually do two to three times. So it's not always exact, exact, but I eyeball about three times and I use, I use a bucket or a scoop so it measures. Um, I don't mix it up right away. I let it sit on top, and then I'm, I turn my pile about once every month. I haven't actually turned it over the winter. I haven't turned it yet, but it, in the warm season, I would turn it once a month. You can turn it every week if you want, but you don't necessarily have to. So I'm, I'm not talking about hot composting, which would be a different process, but for just... I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Do we need sun? It's not... 100% necessary to be in full sun for this kind of process. It helps heat it up, but it's not really ultimately what gets the job done. Um, OK, so this is the big, the, the big info that I want to share with you. It's how do you figure out what kind of system you want? And then uh, I'm going to go through all the different composting systems. Actually, I take that back. Not all the different, because there's hundreds of different composting systems. But you know the, the, most, the ones you've probably heard of. The first step before you put in a new system or before you're going to fix one that's not working right is to think about your goals and uh, who you are. Like really be honest with yourself, who you are, what kind of space do you have, what are your goals. Some people just want to keep their food scraps out of the trash. They don't care if they have the actual compost. So they might be better off with a different kind of system than somebody who wants it for their garden. Um, or your goal might be like, my goal is to have a system that my neighbors can share with, so I want to build something really big so I can have like a neighborhood composting. Um, your time, I work full time and I've got kids, so I'm not going to put a lot of time into it. I might not want anything that requires a huge amount of management. And also your energy, if you're sick or if you're taking care of other people, 
So keep all that in mind before you decide what you're going to do. So now I'm going to go through several different types of compost systems. And I'm just going to tell you pros and cons and ask questions as I go. Um, I'm starting with a pre-made bin. This, is a, this one is, the brand is Soil Saver, and it's the brand that we sell at the district. And this isn't a sales pitch, but we, we have them available at wholesale rates. So it's, a, it's an easy way to get started where, where for, is where is what? Where, where is the district? So we actually have an office down the street on Berry Street, but um, we have a grant so that anybody who attends a compost workshop can get one of these for $35 at the workshop that's only available at the workshop and then they're fifty dollars if you stop by the office but these retail for about ninety um i didn't bring my demo i was telling dan i don't want to schlep it up the stairs about 30 inches by 30 inches. they're yeah they're like 28 across by 30 high so it's it's just it's not yeah but that's that's about the normal size for a compost bin you need something about that size yeah so the hardware cloth for this, this is an open bottom. And the reason is, remember the microorganisms? They're in all soil all the time. One teaspoon of soil has something like two billion microorganisms in it. So you want your compost to touch the soil. However, you don't want rodents coming in. So the way to, to deal with a soil saver is you actually would prep the ground that's going to go in by digging down about two inches square all around and you lay a piece of hardware cloth. Does everybody know what hardware cloth is? No. This is, you can pick this up at any hardware store. It's called hardware cloth. It's not actually cloth. I'm not gonna pass it around because this is really sharp edged right here, but it's a very stiff kind of like large screen almost. Um, and this one has, the holes are a quarter inch. They make them half inch and full inch. I recommend you get the quarter inch hardware cloth because nothing, no rodent is gonna get through this. Occasionally with a half inch, a baby rodent could squeeze through, but you'd probably, yeah. So go with a quarter inch. And what, and there, it's also difficult to handle, so you wanna make sure you have like leather gloves on when you handle it. Um, no, you buy it in a roll, already rolled. You can ask them to, they might be willing to if you let them know you need a certain size and you know. Yeah, so that would be, do you know which ones? Obishans. There you go. You could go to Obishans and get the size you want. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so you, you get a piece that's a few inches bigger around than the bottom of your bin, and you literally just lay that on the ground. And I would lay it with, see how it wants to hold the roll shape? I lay it with the, that roll in shape facing down, because otherwise it's all going to like scooch up right away. Um, so you just set the bin on top of that and if you had dug up around it you might put the soil back on top of the so what happens is an animal's going to try to dig in under to get into this and they're going to hit the hardware cloth and not be able to get in. Um, so that's the way you can keep rodents out of these guys. So if you've already got one of these set up that you didn't do that. Yeah. And it's like a year later. Yeah. You just have to there's two options. One option is get a second one because that's how you can compost through the winter. Um, the, and then, yeah, and then the, what you just said, those bins are really great because if you take the lid off, you can, if you're strong enough, they weigh 30 pounds. It, it'll stay in the shape that's in it. It's, it yeah, I, this is how I switch out my composters. Lift it up, put it down, and then you have like a pile right here which is great because then you can turn it with your pitchfork and you've aerated it and you've gotten all the like new food scraps on the bottom and the old ones on the top. So it's a really nice thing to do. It's probably good to um, do that anyway, even if you weren't gonna add the hardware cloth. So, so you recover it? Like you pick it up, mix it around? And yeah, then and then you would, oh, you mean with browns or recover it with what? Then you move yeah. that in on top of that. Yeah, no, oh, okay. sorry, right. I didn't say it. it Clear, I wasn't clear. So once you pick up the bin and move it, then you're like using some kind of a shovel or pitchfork to move all that oh, material into back the into the bin. Okay. Um, and typically you're gonna find the bottom couple inches are probably already finished compost. Okay. And, but if you wanna let it sit longer, then you let it go turn it, put it back in the bin, and let it sit another period of time. And then if you have two bins, then you do that with all your, I do that every November. 
and then I have that sit over the winter, and I have another bin that is I start my winter with empty, and all the food scraps fill it up over the winter, and usually it goes up and down enough that now I've been adding food scraps all winter, and my bin is like so about half full. You keep adding browns all winter long, same ratio, and then um, you stockpile them. So I like in the fall, I usually collect. Uh, leaves. Often my neighbors are happy to give them to me. I don't actually have many in my own yard. I also do, I spend the five dollars in buying a bale of wood shavings. I put it in the covered Rubbermaid trash container that I keep right next to my compost bin and I have a scoop in there and it just, I always have a container of browns that sits right next to my compost bin. So all winter long it's right there, they stay dry and um, but that way, when everything dissolves and decomposes in the spring, the browns are already mixed in. The likely thing is, if anyone hasn't done this yet this year, and I haven't, is it's still going to be really wet, even if you've been adding browns. So you're probably going to want to turn your pile in the spring and add more browns and let it, because sometimes if it ever gets stinky, it's going to be in the spring, the first turning of the spring. And then it's stinky for about half an hour because you've aerated it. and then. You cover it with browns and that goes away. Um, I'm going to move on unless there's any other questions about soil savers. I, I just wanted to also say that they set up in about 20 to 30 minutes max. They're really easy to set up. That's another advantage to them. This is another pre-made thing. This is um, not a compost bin. It's called a green cone. And now I'm kicking myself that I didn't bring my demo bins with me. Usually I have one of those with me. This is only half of the thing. The rest of it is buried underground. And this is actually a picture of right after these two were installed. So you can see how it's all dug up around them. Um, these are for the person who either has a lot of meat and bone scraps and you don't want to put them in the trash because you can put meat and bones and fish and dairy and even pet waste in these. Um, because they're buried, the only entry is this lid, um, and it's a locking lid. So typically, animals aren't that interested in it, although not. sometimes they figure out they, every now and then we have someone want a new lid because a squirrel's been gnawing at it. Um, but these are more like what we call a digester. The material goes in, it digests underground. The ba it's a basket underground made out of really sturdy plastic, and when the material decomposes it kind of like leaches into the ground around this so this all this soil around these is fertilized so it's really nice if you like put it in the middle of a garden um, but you don't have to some people just want to get the food scraps out of the trash and they don't you don't add browns you don't have to mix it you don't have to move it you just put them in and you don't have to deal with it and you never take stuff out nope never just... yep yes it's about, you're going to have to dig a hole about three feet deep for that. So that's the disadvantage. It takes about uh, one to two hours to um, install it, but then you never deal with it again. So is the, the top part of the thing that's on the ground? Is it? The no, the, I wish I brought my, I'm so sorry, but um, the bottom is more, it looks like a laundry basket. It looks like a round laundry basket, but it's like super sturdy. And um, I will say the manufacturer says that you're supposed to dig those up and move them every three to five years. But we've had people using those for 12 to 13 years who have never moved them and they keep working. If it's not working anymore, but <laughs> um, we have, ha our experience is that the people who are using these for long term haven't had to do that. I know of two people who have dug up and moved theirs. One was an obsessive compulsive and the other ran it over with their car. So, yes. So, did, can you put your other food scraps in there? Yes. So you could put all your food scraps in there, and that's why this one has two, because this family was going to put all their food scraps in it. Oh, they have to do the green. Nope. The right. So that's the advantage. Don't they fill up after one? Um, well, if, one thing I want to point out, they, if they fill up, they're not working. So the idea is that you're just continually adding and they never fill. You'll, you'll see the full food scraps, but they should always be processing. The, the manufacturer says they process between two and three. Can you hold up? Let's see those buckets on the side. Two to, between two to three 
volume buckets about that size per day in the summer and about one in the winter. But that is if it's sited perfectly. So it has to be in full sun. It can't be probably in a bunch of clay. No, it has to be well-drained soil. And if you don't have uh, well-drained soil, there are ways you can install it. Like if you dig a bigger hole than the size of the basket and line it with gravel. But even so, it's gonna, f it, in the spring, the water table's high, it's gonna, like, it's, some of them stop working in the spring because everything's so wet. It's just, you know, it needs to drain. Do you have to water them for 10? Nope. Like no. no, you don't water them. The, this lid flips up. Yeah. and stuff goes in, but you don't need to do, the, that's the beauty of this. It's a pain in the neck in the beginning when you have to have the right site and you have to spend time putting it in, but then you don't have to deal with it again. This big. <laughs> I actually have them. So I had, I think some of you know that we do have, um, we're selling soil savers for $35 and these for 90. We usually sell them for 125 today and we actually have them in the van which I'll tell you after we're done if anybody wants to do that so I could like bring one out to show you and we're parked over at the VSC parking lot right now um, but yeah it's fairly substantially sized but once it's installed the cone is only up to about here and they're fairly unobtrusive once you start noticing them you'll see they're actually in yards all over downtown Montpelier but you have to like know to look to them because they kind of blend in any other questions before we move on? Yes. Um, the fact that there's so many in Montpelier, does that mean that a lot of the soil around here does drain well enough? Or do you think that most people that get those would need to add something to make their soil drain? Um, I think it's a combo. I, like, I would recommend adding the gravel and the sand anyway, even if you are pretty sure you have well-drained soil, because it can't hurt. And you're only going to install it once, so you might as well do the extra when you're installing it and then you've sort of built in a little bit of extra drainage for yourself. Yes? So there's like, you know when you smell this and people live there. Right. When you open it to add food scraps, you'll smell something. But once you close it, it there's no smell. That, that's why it's kind of neat when you start noticing them around downtown. Dogs don't go near them, they don't notice them. I have heard of some people having, um, when they first install them and the soil's still a little loose, that a skunk or a raccoon might try to dig in. Um, that I've only heard of that once, and what we recommend is good old hardware cloth. You, if you cut this into like 12 inch strips and you just line them around, like in a square around the bin, when you install it, that stops that digging and then you really don't have animal issues. So you're going to be digging a hole in the ground. The basket goes underground. And, and where the basket and the lid screw together, yeah. um, that goes about an inch under the soil as well. Yeah, so you would just lay this on around it, cover it up with sod or soil. And yeah. Yeah, you're not putting this inside it. You're just putting it around it. And yes, the material disintegrates inside. Yes, you lay it down around it. I'm, I wish I had better pictures for that. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to keep moving because we're closing in on our time. Yes, one more question. Um, I see that they're out in the wide open, but would you be able to garden around it, like say like the tiger lilies or something, mm -hmm. to hide it as long as it still has the Definitely, yeah. The only case, we, uh, a friend of mine got one of these about five, three or four years ago, maybe five and put it right next to her lilac bush. The lilac bush got so big, it's like grown over and around it. And I'm like, you need to move it because now it's in shade. That is the only, like if you put a bush around it, eventually you're gonna shade it and it really needs the sun to work. But if you're doing like flowers or perennials that don't get too much bigger than it, totally, yeah, and they'll love it. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk about a couple other systems. Those were the pre-builts um, and I don't, I feel like it sounds like I'm pushing that, but I'm not. I actually think there's plenty of things you can do without spending money or with minimal money, but they just take more time. This is an example of an open pile. I'm putting it out there because I just want you to know if you, anyone here compost this way? Oh, we got a whole crowd. Yeah. I'm gonna ask you to stop. That's um, <laughs> our house is yeah. 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 It's, it's 
Awesome. Yeah. And the thing that finally brought me around, because I composted an open pile for 20 years, but I lived way out in Woodbury, and even though we had bears, they never came to my property. Yes, we had little rodents, but it didn't matter because my nearest neighbor was so far away, they didn't notice. And actually, the rodents brought owls, so it was kind of cool. But if you're downtown, you don't want that. And the, but here's what sold me. There is a fungus that will grow on your food as it's decomposing that's toxic. And if a, and a dog eats it, the dog could die. And that actually happened in Montpelier a couple years ago. A dog named Mabel um, got into somebody's open compost pile, ate something that had that fungicide or uh, fungus on it, and, and the dog died. So we're, I can't say we're all dog lovers. I don't know all of you, but we do kind of live in a culture where we don't want dogs to die. Um, so I would just say, if you're composting like this, yes, your food scraps will compost, but it's, there's a lot of other reasons why it's not a good idea, and, and it's mainly about animals. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Just um, So now that was sort of like the easiest way to compost, open pile. This is the most like Rolls Royce way, three bin system. Anybody here been to North Branch since we put in our three bin system, North Branch Nature Center? So yeah, we built one of those at North Branch. We built one at Quarry Hill Apartments in Barrie Town. We're putting one in at Avery Apartments in Barrie. Uh, I think it's I, another part of Barrie. And we have one at a condo site on um, Franklin Street, right near the middle school. They take a lot of time, effort, energy, and money. It's about $300 worth of lumber if you buy your lumber new. But if you're really like, have a lot of food scraps or you're sharing with your neighbors, this is kind of a neat system. And you can also do these, you can do a two bin. You don't have to do three bins. Um, this is also nice if you just do two bins. Um, but this is designed so that this, this person is saving their browns right here, and they just have like a fence in a circle and they put their leaves in it. Um, and yeah, they're not water, they're gonna get wet, but it doesn't really matter because actually when you put your browns in your food scraps, they get wet anyway. So I'm sort of like, who used the term? Was it you, casual composter? I'm a casual composer, so I'm like, I don't care if it's wet, it's gonna get wet. But if you care about that, you'd want a covered thing. Then this is the first bin where you add your materials. So you put your food scraps and your browns and you've got them stored right there. And then when this gets about half full, um, you just, these are actually um, planks that slide up and down. You pull the planks out, you take a pitchfork, you move all the food scraps into this bin, you put your browns on top and then you let it sit while you fill this bin up. And when this bin's filled up, you do it again and you just keep moving things over until by the time they're, they've been in this bin for long enough, you've got finished compost. And if you still aren't happy with that, you can pull the compost out and let it sit in a pile next to it, and that's called curing, which uh, a lot of people recommend. I actually have never done that myself. I just put it right after it's finished, I put it right in my garden. But curing is just another way to like sort of let all the microorganisms finish what they're doing and before you put it in your compost pile. So that's the Rolls Royce. Um, tumblers, who's using a tumbler? Well. Yeah, well, so I'm thinking about it. I would say don't do it. Um, tumblers are like the great, you know, deception. They seem really cool. And the one good thing I love about them is they're fully enclosed. So if your concern is animals, you could use a tumbler to start your food scraps because it's fully enclosed. The animals aren't going to get in it but you need another part of your system. It's like half a system because tumblers are small. They're gonna fill up. And then what do you do when they fill up and they're not done composting? I use mine in the winter because I can put it closer to the house. Oh, I like that. Compost pile is. Yeah. So it's kind of like temporary and then we'll And then you bring it to your pile. Yeah. I like that system a lot, yeah. Just open it up and put it real Yeah. Like that. so that's, the, that's exactly what I was talking about. If it's like one part of a system, they, they're great because then by the time it's in your pile, they've already started decomposing, so they're less attractive to animals, too, at that point. Um, these homemade ones you see a lot of, these are very heavy. Uh, it takes a very strong person to turn that when it's full, so I would say stay away from that if you're going to go for a tumbler. This is one that's the fancy, fancy, fanciest of all the tumblers. I just got one for myself because I'm really, like, I nerd out on this stuff and I want to try everything. But we use these at our community composting sites. And the reason I like, this is the only tumbler I like, because it's got two chambers. 
and it's insulated. So you can fill up one chamber, it heats up like really fast. You have to add your browns to a tumbler just like you do a regular pile. Um, but in, in this insulated chamber, it'll heat up to like 150 degrees. So you're hot composting in there. When that's full, you just close it, lock it, and you fill up the other side. And when that's full, yeah, you could, I still don't love doing meat. You could do minimal amounts of meat because it's totally enclosed, yeah. Um, that is, eyeball it. So if it's like, it's, the watering is sort of like, uh, test it with your hand. If you put your hand in and squeeze it, some people don't want to do that, but, um, or um, if you squeeze the material and it sticks together, like a damp, about the consistency of a damp sponge, it doesn't need water, it's just right. If it crumbles apart and is a little dry, you could add you, like a bucket or like a gallon of water. I wouldn't add too much to this because it's so enclosed. It's not going to be draining the way a pile would be. So I just have a quick question. You said earlier that the, the big space saver kind or whatever you call that needs this underneath and it needs to be on soil. Is it because this is hot that it doesn't oh, need yes. microbes or whatever? Actually, it does, and I'm really glad I forgot to say that part. Oh. Um, yeah, microorganisms, remember them? Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you have a tumbler that's not working, and in this, I would start it out with a shovel full of soil. So you're essentially inoculating it with any fully enclosed system that's not touching the earth. Just any shovel full of soil. It could be from your lawn. It doesn't have to be special other than that. Yes? Back to the, uh, using the uh, uh, cloth under the soil saver. Yeah. What's the issue with rodents? Who cares? Well, that's for people who care. Okay. If you don't care, you don't have to. Because frankly, they yeah. get in, they burrow, they aerate. They're aerating it. Yeah, there's plenty of people who really don't care. I mean, yeah, and I would say if you live in a downtown area, it would prevent rats, and I highly recommend that because if you get rats, it's going to infest your neighbor's yards. And But if, you know, it, that's it's why. It's voles and moles. Yeah, so, I mean, maybe you don't need to do that. <laughs> Um, but if you think you might, if you think there are rats in your neighborhood, just out of courtesy to your neighbors, yeah, yeah. I would recommend doing that. Um, yeah, there are people who really don't mind the little animals, and um, it's just about if you're in a, you know, your neighborhood versus out in the country and what your tolerance is. Um, this, I just wanted to introduce you. Does anybody has anybody heard of trench composting? This is really for gardeners. Um, I've done it one year I did it and I loved it because what you're doing, this is a terrible photo, sorry, but you dig a trench before you get started about uh, 18 inches deep um, and then you add your food scraps as you go and every time you add, typically you wouldn't have like that volume, this has the whole trench filled up, typically you'd fill like your one bucket of food scraps, you cover it with soil and then, and then you add your next bucket a day or two later, add the soil until the trench is full. And the neat thing about that is you don't add browns. You don't have to mix it. It just goes in the soil, you cover it. You can plant right on top of it. I, when I did it, I did not have any animals that were interested in it. And I had a family of skunks living in my shed at the time. So it works. It's a great solution for meat and fish and bones. And also in bear season, I promised, was it you? I promised you we'd talk about bears. You want to also, bear season is right now when they're starting to come out of hibernation and they're really hungry. You want to keep sweet smelling fruit out of your compost at this time because that interests them. It's like cantaloupe rinds, strawberry holes. So you can put those in a trench composting system and it's covered with enough soil, they don't smell it. You could throw some seeds right on top of it too. And by the time you get, it, it just weirdly just disappears into the soil. It's kind of a neat system. But it's really for gardeners. If you're not gardening, it's and you not don't something. Have to add browns. No, you don't add browns to that system, soil. just the soil. Yeah. Why is it for gardeners? Because eventually well, you just. Because like, it's in a garden. Okay. So yeah. in your garden. Yeah. Along a fence line I suppose you like. could do it along anywhere. I, never, I didn't think of that. I, in my mind, it was in a garden. But yeah, you could dig a trench anywhere. I just think the, the value of it is that you have the fertility in your yeah. garden and you can take advantage of it pretty quickly. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on. Some of this stuff is going to be like uh, compost 101, like really beginner level, but just want to reiterate it for all of us. Um, collecting food scraps, um, you basically get some kind of a system. Anyone who wants one can have one of those pails right, right before you leave. Um, that's a, that is a fairly inexpensive way to just have a bucket on your 
counter. Those we sell those for three dollars, so that's like the cheapest you can do unless you're using like a used yogurt container. Um, but they um, so and you just put any your all your food scraps except meat and bones and fish in there, including tea bags and coffee grounds and the coffee filters, including eggshells, citrus. I will say one thing about citrus. Does anybody know? Yeah, citrus comes pre-loaded with fruit flies, um, just so you know. Yeah, fruit flies. So basically, it's gross to think about, but most citrus has fruit fly maggots in the peels. Um, yeah, it's pretty gross, but it, we've all been eating citrus for years and never cared or noticed. But if you're worried about fruit flies and you eat citrus, you might want to get the citrus peels out in your compost quickly because they could hatch if they're on your counter. That's just a little tip. Is this on purpose? No, it's not like nobody's <laughs> injecting them with maggots. <laughs> well, first of all, fruit flies are tiny. Yeah. So it means like a little fruit fly laid an egg in the thing. And you know, it's kind of good because everything's alive. And that's alive. And it means it's not so poisoned that that happened. But on the other hand, if you don't want fruit flies in your kitchen, you don't want citrus peels in there too long. That's all. Two questions. Yes. Uh, go ahead. And then. Well, what I do, since I live by myself, Ah, I like that. So that, that that's, that's a good a tip. You could do that in the freezer too if you had space. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we had, do with, with meat bones. Yeah. Before the trash comes. Yep. I put them in the freezer bag. Yep. Or, you know, just the that's a great tip. And for yes. Vermont Compost Company, they take meat bones. Yes. I'm glad you mentioned that. Right up, does everybody know where Vermont Compost Company is? Right up, if you keep going up Main Street another mile and a half or so. They're on the left-hand side, and you can bring your food scraps there for free. Yeah. Um, I, you had a question? I, I usually rinse off bananas and, and fruit like that. Yeah. You kind of like scrum them? No, that's not going to really change it. And if you've never noticed it before, you probably won't notice it now. But anybody who's worried about fruit flies, that's the main reason you would get them. And it just means if you're saving your food scraps, put them out in your bin every day or every other day. You know, Just make it part of your routine, and then it won't be an issue. Wait, there was a question over here. Yes. In the winter, I, I use kitchen scissors and I cut them up into small yeah. pieces. That's great. Yeah, cutting them up small really helps. Yes. We had a person over here and then. Do you have an enclosed bin where the storage is everything? Yep. Um, could you put limited amounts of fish scraps or meats or something in it? I mean, personally, I would, but I also. Like, I'm trying not to totally encourage composting meat scraps, but I think if you had a little bit and it was in a tumbler and it wasn't closed, you might, you might notice more of a smell if there's meat in there and you would want to add a little extra browns if you were doing that. But if you're in any kind of an open bin, even the soil saver that has a lid, I would keep the meat scraps out. Uh, we had a person over here. Quickly, I've heard a lot because we eat a lot of oranges in our family. Yeah. It, the citrus gets the soil a little bit off balance. Is well, I guess if you eat that many, I well, mean, I, I wouldn't. I, don't think, I think anything, if you have large quantity, it could. Yeah. Um, and if you're worried about it, you. Citrus, all those very acidy things. I don't think it's going to be a quantity that you have to be. But if you are worried, you can test your soil. UVM Extension has a fairly, like, I think it's 10 or $15 okay. to test your soil, and they might have recommendations for you. But you're um, not worried about anybody throwing lime in the, uh, in the soil savers. Nah, no. no, I wouldn't do that. You may, I would test your soil rather than put it in the compost bin. One more question, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Oh, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, they're treated with fungicide. So flowers from a florist, um, some of them have herbicides too. So a fungicide is going to slow down. Remember the microorganisms? There's also fungi and other organisms that are making your compost decompose and become so compost. The tools you buy at Straws, you shouldn't have been putting in your compost. No. Yeah. It's not going to, you know, if you already did it, it, it probably is such a small amount, it's going to slow it down. It's not going to stop it. But in general, I would put those either in a separate space or, you know, somewhere out of the compost pile. Mm -hmm. Just because why add a fungicide when you need the fungi to. But regular house plant. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like, and if you get tulips here, you don't have to worry about it because they don't have that. Um, or like pl flowers that you pick in, the, in a meadow, but you just don't want the stuff that's been treated. And that's pretty much mainstream florists do that. Yeah. Someone told me that you can put the lake from your 
dry or heat? I don't recommend that because, okay, for example, this super eco-friendly vest from Patagonia is made out of recycled bottles. That means all of the lint from it is a microplastic. If you add that to your compost, you're adding microplastics to your soil. So it's unfortunate, but um, a lot of our clothing is not made out of natural materials and it's not a good thing for that to get mixed in with the soil. Yes? Is there any kind of compostable bag like I see in the lower right hand? Yeah. Okay, where would you find them? Um, there's two things I want to say about compostable bags. One is you don't need them, but if you, some people really feel more comfortable with a liner. Um, if you want one, I don't know where they sell them locally, but uh, you make sure you look for something that's called BPI certified. BPI stands for Biodegradable Product Institute, I believe. Um, don't get anything if it doesn't say BPI certified because it's basically greenwashed. Um, if you get a compostable bag that is BPI certified, it will break down in your backyard compost. Is there something else you could use just to put at the bottom of it? Yeah, so definitely. That was the second thing I wanted to say okay. is paper bags work wonders for that. Okay. Or some people will even fold up newspaper and put it on the bottom. Um, if you, a lot of compost bins can go through a dishwasher too if you want to make sure it's cleaned out pretty good. I like to fill it up with water, swirl it around and put that right on my garden. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, like the, the leavings on the bin. But yeah, for a liner, I, I like paper bags and newspaper as an option, because then you could use a paper towel as long as it's not the stretchy kind. If it's stretchy, it has plastic in it. But if it's just only paper, that can go right in the compost bin with everything else. Does that mean like penalty has paper? Or has yes, paper if it stretches, it? it does. Yes. I uh, have been adding wood shavings to my compost. Just, oh like, yeah. Odor, yep. I'm finding that if I, when, I, when I empty my bucket, if I start with an inch or two in the bottom, when I empty my bucket, pretty That's much stick, yeah. everything just empties, empties out. And you don't have all that goop at the bottom. Mm -hmm. of your That's a really good it trick. Works really good. Yeah. Can you use wax paper? You can add wax paper to your compost, yeah. I would rip it up a little bit first. People have limited space. The other thing we do is we dry our coffee grounds. You know, we use the paper, paper uh, um, filters, and then we put them around blueberry bushes. Yeah, I've it's heard like that. Uh, yeah. And it, and it also kind of composts. Yep. It also kind of mulches around yep. the bushes. Yeah. Um, we're getting close to when we're supposed to end, and I'm not done, so I'm going to flip through a few more. I don't need to focus on that too much. The point of this slide is just you can use anything to hold your food scraps. You can also use a stainless, one of those, you know, kind of fancier with filtered ones. Those are also nice. But if you can't afford it or you don't want to do that, there's you can use, that even shows like a used rotisserie chicken. There's what we can do with the black plastic thing. Um, so it's, I had a sheetrock bucket that I used for about 12 years before it finally cracked too much to use. So it's really up to you. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. This is our list from when we, mostly from when we worked with uh, like grocery stores and restaurants. In your own backyard compost, you're gonna be aware of um, the things you don't want in there. The silverware came from because at schools, there was always silverware in it. Um, a plant. What? Anything that's not formally a plant? Yeah, so. Um, I thought that's what we were putting in. This is what stays out. Anything that has never been a plant can't go in. So if it's um, paper, that used to be a tree, you can put it in. If it's uh, plastic in your paper towel, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, again, did you? What's the ratio? Three one. Yay! <laughs> Three parts browns, one part green. And that's because you love your neighbors. So that's going to keep your smells down, which is going to keep the animals away. Um, and we already talked about what those are, so I'm going to keep going. Um, and this, I don't mean to de-emphasize because I only have one slide on this, but it's, the turning it is really important. What do your microorganisms need? Air. What else? Water. And, and food. But sun helps. Um, so yes, yeah, so turning them. This shows a pitchfork. That's what I use. These are a couple of other options if you want to buy a special tool for turning your compost. This one you kind of like twirl down in and then it pulls up like a core sample almost. Um, and this one is kind of neat because you push it down and these two things slide up. And then when it gets down there and you pull it up, it kind of spreads out and it'll pull up. Here we can pass, if, I don't know if it's enough space. I got both of these on Amazon, but there's a lot of gardener supply stores. I, you, I have looked and looked. 
the regular hardware stores around here don't carry anything like this. Yeah, I've looked everywhere. And if you find one that does, let me know, because I will send business their way. I'm going to leave these here, and you can come look at them later. Um, yes? You don't need it. Nope, you don't need it. If you feel like your compost is failing, add browns, turn it. And then if you're really worried, add a little shovel full of soil. But the, anything that you buy that costs money that someone tells you is compost booster is just a, a fraud. You don't need that stuff. So I said, the, the bin that I had that hasn't done much, they said if I put in a few handfuls of dirt, that would actually help. I would do that. And don't forget your browns, too. Right. Is this a tumbler that it's wasn't working? Kind of a nice one it's on something and it's, it's not a pile like that. Yeah. Although the bear didn't move it once. Add your browns, add a shovel full of dirt, give it a turn. Oh, let's talk about bears. Let's talk about bears. Um, ah, perfect timing. First of all, who, anyone have a bird seeder up still? Perfect, good, okay. I think we all know by now, that's what's bringing the bears in. It's not your compost, it's your bird feeders. And if it's not your bird feeder, it's your neighbor's bird feeder. So you might wanna have a friendly, slightly uncomfortable conversation with your neighbor if they're bringing bears in with bird feeders. Um, but yes. When a mother bear I watched from my house, she went toward my three bin, my three yeah. separate bins that yep. were covered. She was just looking for food for her babies. Yeah. She went through everything. Yeah. Well, down. so what'll happen is they'll come in because they smell the bird food, which they can smell from one to two miles away, miles. Wow. Um, but the mm -hmm. compost isn't going to, they're not going to smell that from one to two miles away. But once they come close, they'll smell it and it's food, so they'll check it out. So that's why you saw her there. Um, so if the bear's coming anyway, if you see the mother bear, grab a pot and pan and bang it and yell. Because it's, have you ever heard the expression a fed bear is a dead bear? Yeah, so we, I, I love bears, and I would, like, I, I would love to see a bear, but I don't really want to see one because I know as soon as I see one, they're in danger. Someone's going to shoot it, or Fish and Wildlife is going to have to do something, so I would make a lot of noise if you do see a bear. Don't go out running out to the bear, but yell at it from your house, bang a pot and pan. Um, the other trick, um, of course, me, keeping the meat out, the ammonia trick. This is one I learned from Forrest Hammond, who's the state bear biologist. Um, he said, if a bear, like you might want to do this since you saw one and also you, um, soak a rag in ammonia and put it in a five gallon bucket right near your compost bin. The, remember what I just said, they can smell bird seed from a mile or two away? Well, if they can smell bird seed, they can smell ammonia and they're not going to like it. So that's going to keep them out they're going to smell that smell, they're going to not like it, and they'll stay away. The other thing Fish and Wildlife recommends that I think is kind of a big deal for a compost bin, but it is another thing you could do, is to put an electric fence around it, especially chickens. They're now recommending electric fences for chickens. That's up to you. I would rather start with the ammonia trick. Yes? I have a question. Uh, would that work around the beehives? Yes, it is recommended for beehives, electric so fence. The ammonia, oh, the ammonia, or I don't know. That's a good, I would ask someone who knows more about bees. I don't know that. I'll ask. But you, I would, if you have bees, I would invest in electric fence around the bees. Yeah. Um, also, for your compost, other, besides like lining, if you're going to make a bin or buy the pre made bin, this is your best friend. This is what keeps the smaller mammals out. This isn't going to stop a bear, but it's going to keep out the rodents and the skunks and the raccoons and the rats, but you have to really line your bin. Um, so if you're making a bin, every side needs to be lined with hardware cloth. Um, also, you, there's a website called predatorp.com. You can buy coyote urine or other, like if you really are worried about your, predator, your animals. Um, also, you can pee oh, yourself yeah. around or on your compost pile, and you can put hot pepper, like large quantities of hot pepper, like get it a, you know, like a quart size container at the bulk bin. And um, if you know, this worked for me when I had a skunk getting in, I sprinkled it around and I put it on top and I did that a couple days in a row. It, it'll last until the rain washes it away, but it's a good way to sort of keep them away and you have to reapply regularly. So that's a good idea because we do um, uh, sunflower seeds in the winter. We had uh, raccoons come around. Yeah. And we never thought of spreading hot pepper on the ground because they like to get whatever they do. Yeah, we'll try it. 
try it. Um, so I would like to ask a few more questions, just acknowledging that we're over a little bit. I'm going to have a few wrap-up things. One is that Dan has us, we asked you to fill out a little survey before you got here. We have one that we'd like you to fill out after. It's part of our process to make sure if we can improve the workshop. And they should only take a minute. Everybody gets one of those buckets um, if you want to collect food scraps. If you don't get a bucket, at least take the compost guide in there. It goes through a few other types of systems. And if anybody wants one of the $35 soil savers or the $90 green cones, I'm going to set up here. And what I'll do is I'll get take your order and give you your receipt. And then I have everything out in the van, out in the parking lot. So if you, you'll have to wait until I'm done taking orders. And now we can go meet out. I'm over way over in the VSC in the big white van. And either Dan or I will go out there and we'll get you your soil saver or green cone right now. So any questions before we start that process? All right, thank you guys so much for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, tap, tap, tap. Um,